All right, good morning, everybody, and welcome Westlight Church. Uh, so my name is Brian Ono, and um, it's really a great honor to be here. Uh, so thank you for having me here. Um, I spoke, yes, Laurie, it was a few years ago, and um, I have a lot of fond memories here. I want to thank Westlight, especially for just really uh, being a second home to my son, Michael. Uh, way back in the day, he was a student at UCLA, and, um, you know, so it was a rough time for our family. My father had just passed, and um, and he was, he really didn't know anyone, but uh, this church really embraced him, and from that point on, he's been, this has been his, his second home, and over the years, I've been privileged to become friends with uh, many of you, and uh, you've been a second home to me, too, so thank you. So in Mark, and as well as Matthew and Luke, uh, Jesus says the two greatest commandments. And the first one is this, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then in the next verse, he adds the second commandment is love your neighbor as yourself. So last week, uh, we learned about mind. And I think the first thing I want to say is that there is no one that's more important than the other. Heart, soul, mind, and strength, they all have equal value and equal import because it's the combination of all those elements that brings wholeness. So when we don't incorporate all of those elements, we lack the wholeness so today I'm here to talk about soul. So what is soul? Soul is our essence, something beyond words, something that is experienced. So I'm going to give you a few examples, because I think rather than give you an explanation, I'd rather give you examples, experiences from my own life. So, OK, I'm probably older than most of you guys. And so when I was a little kid, I liked the Beatles, okay? All right, all right, so the Beatles. All right, so now um, I just, well, four, two of them have passed. Uh, the other two are, well, they're in their 80s, believe it or not. That's crazy, huh? Now, I'm not that old, but, you know, I, so, but there, there's a cover band from the Netherlands called The Analogs. And if you're a Beatles fan, they are just, they're just great. So the last few albums that they did, they never performed them live. Because uh, music in those days had become more complex, and they could not duplicate um, the music that they wanted to live. So they created that music in the studio. So they never performed that music live. But uh, the analogs, of course, now we're in, uh, you know, now we're in the... 21st century, we could do anything now. And so this band from the Netherlands, they decided that they're going to perform this music that the Beatles themselves had never performed live, but they're going to perform before a live audience. And um, it's just great, okay? But anyway, so I'm sitting at home with my 65-inch Samsung, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm looking at this performance of a song that even those of you that weren't born anywhere near that time, uh, you might know. And it's a song written by Paul McCartney. It's called Let It Be. And it starts like this. When I find myself in times of trouble, Mother Mary comes to me, speaking words of wisdom, let it be. And in my hour of darkness, she is standing right in front of me, Speaking words of wisdom, let it be. But anyway, the, this band, I mean, they performed that song note for note. It was so good. And I was watching this and experiencing this in my own living room. I had the volume cranked up. And I found something interesting. I found tears starting to come down my face. Because that music touched me in a way that I cannot explain. 
They say that art has an ability to touch our souls. That music is sometimes what they call a thin place. That was an experience of soul. Okay, let me give you another example. One of my favorite places is Hawaii. Before the pandemic, Sandy and I were going there every year practically. So my stepmother is from Maui. And, you know, if you were to ask Sandy or I, we like all parts of Hawaii. In fact, we were just there a few months ago. We, we went with Michael, but we didn't go to Maui. We, but what is it about Maui? And I was trying to put my finger on it. But, you know, when I go to that place, I just feel the spirit of my stepmom. And the place that we, Sandy and I, stay at is literally walking distance from where she grew up. And uh, she's passed on as well. But when, toward the end of her life, she wasn't talking so much about things that had happened recently. Her memories went back to those days when she was growing up in Hawaii, and she would describe a certain tree or she would describe what it was like. So when I'm there with Sandy, that place, the spirit of that place, the spirit of my mom moves me in a deep way. That is an example of soul. Also, there's something about that place that when we're looking at, uh, we're right there on the west-facing west, west facing beaches, and there's a channel between Maui and Molokai and Lanai. And Sandy and I have had, had, have had the most profound spiritual experiences. As the sun star slowly starts to set over that channel, and those the rays of the sun, we see that in that channel, shimmering over the water, coming right at us. And both Sandy and I have been moved to tears again, feeling the presence of the Almighty, that God is with us, and just feeling and embracing his love. That is an example of soul. Another example, I, I saw little Elena and little Masami this morning, and they're just the most beautiful children. But I know that uh, Pastor Tim and his wife Megan and Daniel and his wife Jordan, if you were to come up to them and say, describe the love that you have for your child, how, how can you describe that? My son graduated from UCLA, just not too far from here. And I remember the day of his graduation. And I'll never forget this, because uh, Paul and Lori and Jordan actually came to his graduation. And I, I snapped a picture there, because they were like his second family in those years when, when he was there. But you know, the, the pride that you feel toward your... And by the way, and this is for Tim and Megan and Daniel and Jordan. Let me, let me tell you something. It doesn't matter, you know, they're little now. But let me tell you, when you get to be my age, they're still going to be your, your, your kids. Yeah, right, right, Lori, you know. It's, it's just, you know, I know Mike is going off to Georgia tomorrow. But you know what? It, they never stop being your kids. But that feeling... That feeling of love that you have for Masami or for Elena, that is soul. I have another, another story. A, a friend of mine, a really dear friend of mine that I've known basically my whole life. And he, uh, his mom was in a nursing facility up in Eagle Rock. And so every once in a while, I would go to visit her. 
and just to be with her. And sometimes she was more present than at other times. But this one time I went there and her wheelchair was kind of wheeled out halfway. It was halfway into the hallway, halfway into her room, and her head was down. And I'm thinking, oh, my Lord, I drove all the way to Eagle Rock, and she's not even uh, real present. But you know what? The Lord just prompted me, you don't have to say anything. Go and sit with Noreen. Just, just sit with her. And so I did, and I talked to her. I whispered a little bit into her ear, and there was no response. I don't think, I don't know. Only the Lord knows whether she heard anything I said. But I do believe that our spirit's still connected. And so finally, after about 10 minutes of just sitting with her, of just presence, I whispered in her ear, and I said, Noreen, I said, I, I'm going to pray for you now. And then I'm going to go. And, and so I put my hand on Noreen. And I just looked. And just a few feet away was another woman, also in a wheelchair. And when I said, I'm going to pray, I saw her bow. I saw this other woman that I never knew. I didn't know who she was. She bowed her head. She closed her eyes. And I just feel in my heart that our spirits were all connected there. The Lord's presence was thick in that place. I do not know if Noreen heard me, but I do believe that we were still connected through the Lord. And I know that that woman was connected to the Lord. That was an example of soul. You see, soul is a deep connection beyond words. Again, I'm showing my age now, but back when I was a kid, there was a style of music called soul music, okay? And soul music has its roots in, actually, you could trace it back to the Negro spirituals. And the Negro spirituals were born in the days of slavery, you see, music was a way for slaves to express feelings, whether it was sorrow, joy, inspiration, or hope. There's a term. When you're playing with feeling, when you're playing with authenticity, when you're playing with something that comes from something deep in, within, you're not just playing, you're just not playing the notes. You're just not singing the tune. You know, have you ever heard two different versions of the same song? And in one version, they've got those the technical notes right, but it's kind of flat. Not literally flat, you know, like, but it's just kind of eh. And then somebody else will take that same tune. Like I've heard it, for example, a, a song we all know, like Amazing Grace. And somebody just sings it, Amazing Grace, da, 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 da. And then somebody, Aretha Franklin or something, oh. Dude, she sings it with soul. You know what I'm talking about? Okay, and, and soul, soul. To sing, have you turned, if you heard the expression to sing soulfully? Man, you know, you know, when I, I'm playing the piano and stuff, and when I'm just really into it, people, I know it, and people know it. It's just coming out of you organically. Because it's soulful. Soul is expressing who you are in authenticity. Soul is being real. Okay, I'm going to now gravitate toward a saying of Jesus from the Gospel of John. He says in John 15:4, I am the vine, and you are the branches. Okay, so Jesus, you know what he's doing? He is naming who he is. And when we are in soul, we are naming 
who we really are, who we really are in authenticity. You know, who, who is this guy? Is this guy just the carpenter's son? I mean, no, he says, I am. You know, you know, by the way, this is a little deviation here. You know, Jesus makes these seven I am statements in the Gospel of John. And that harkens back to Exodus 3. You know, Moses, right? God's talking to Moses. He said, hey, man, you want me? You want me to lead the people out of bondage? Well, who do I say sent me? And then you know what God tells Moses? He says, he says, I am sent you. What? And God says, I am who I am. So when Jesus says, I am the vine, what's Jesus doing? He is naming who he is, who he is in complete authenticity. Naming truth, naming truth is a component of soul. It's authenticity without shame. In that same passage, he says, abide in me as I abide in you. You know, John, the gospel of John is sometimes called the gospel of love, but I say it is also the gospel of soul. It's the gospel of soul, man, because John speaks in metaphor, which is the language of soul. What does it mean to abide? The Greek word is meno, and meno means to remain, to be connected. Connection connotes relationship. So there's this flow between us and the divine. So it says, abide in me. Well, what does that mean? Come on, come on. Let's, let's, let's get to it. What does that mean? Well, in the epistle of John, 1 John 4, 16, it says this. And this just boils it down right here, guys. It says, God is love. And those who abide in love abide in God. And God abides in them. I'd like you to all say this with me again. God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. You know, guys, let's get down to it. You know, every, every week we come here and we hear a sermon, and there's teaching, and it's good teaching. But, you know, let me tell you, knowledge in and of itself doesn't mean much to people. I'm talking about, think of the, the people in your families. Think about your coworkers. Think about the people in your neighborhood. Think about the people in your life, even the people here at church. You know, people are not interested in theology or ideas as much as how you live. You see, guys, in the end, when we are connected to that vine, what is the essence of the vine? We just said it. It's love. It's love. God is love. And those who abide in God, and those who abide in love, abide in God. And God abides in them. That is what it means to be connected to the vine. The question is this. It's not how much do you know. Are you more loving? Are you more patient? Are you kinder? Are you more generous? Do you have joy? These are the fruit, you know, because later on in that passage, John talks about if you abide in the vine, you're going to bear fruit. And then Apostle Paul, in his letter to the Galatians, we all know this, he talks about the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, and so forth. This is what they're talking about. That's what people care about. Not how much you could quote, oh, I, I've memorized all of John 4. Well, that's great. But you still kick your dog and you, you don't treat your wife very good. See, the thing is, at the end of the day, is are we really connected to the vine? And that is living out of soul. You see, soul deals with authenticity, honesty, and nakedness. You know, the problem is, 
you know, we were all born. You know, when, when little Masami, when little Elena were born, they came into this world without any baggage, you know? It's like if we go back to Genesis 1, when men and women were first created, it says they were naked and not ashamed. You know why? Because they came into this world, and then, but guess what happens? You know, then uh, things happen to us. And then, um, well, you know, in Genesis, they ate of the fruit, okay? And then they realize, oh my goodness, we're, we're, there's something wrong. And so then they tried to cover themselves up. And I'm talking about metaphorically. So they tried to sow fig leaves. But do you know that? That's what all of us do, including me. We try to put up all these things because we're wounded. You know, we're born, all of us, you know, and I just keep picking on these two little, little ones here. But they represent you and me and all of us. When we came into the world, we came into the world unwounded, okay? But in fact, do you know that the, the Latin word for innocent, you know what the, the Latin word for innocent, you know what it means? It means unwounded. But we are caught up in our own drama, our own lies, that who, are, who, we, who, who we are is based on how we look, how many friends we have, how much money we make, where we went to school. But, they, but those things don't deal with our true essence. See, our true essence is who we are in the vine, what Paul calls hidden with Christ in God. And then, furthermore, we're caught up into this toxic drama of comparison. Oh, my kid went to this school. Your kid went to that school. I drive this kind of car. You drive that kind of car. I live in this neighborhood. You live in I make this much. And all this whole drama stuff, it starts. You know what that, that's our woundedness. It's passed to us. You know who first passes, passes this to us? It's our own parents. You know, but my parents love me. Yeah, they do love you. But guess what? They're wounded. They have baggage. That, that woundedness, that baggage is what the Bible calls sin. But you know what? It, it's, all, it's all in fact. And you know, our parents love us. But guess what? Their parents pass that junk on to them, and then it gets passed on generationally. And when we're caught in that shame... It's hard to live out of authenticity. And when we are not living in that place of authenticity, then we're not living out of soul. When we can live out of a soulful place without apologies, that's when we are connected to the vine. You see, loving God with soul, it says, love the Lord your God with your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Loving God with soul is loving God by being who you really are in honest, authentic communion with him. Now, guess what? I have a lot of friends, okay? Uh, I, you know, I got a, a lot of friends, okay? But I think of all my friends, okay? I think of the two gentlemen that are my friends here. I'm not going to mention their names. Actually, I'm going to mention one of them later. A little bit later. But these two men, I love these guys. They are, they are my bros. But they're very different. Okay, We're all very different because God in his infinite just beauty and love, thank goodness he didn't create us all the same. You know, in 1 Corinthians 12, Paul talks about the body. And he says we're not, he goes, if we're all uh, this where would the sense of hearing be? If we're all this, where would the sense of smell be? And so on and so forth. He's using analogy to talk about how we're all different. And you know how you love God with soul? You love God with soul by being who you authentically are. You know, I, the same guy that, you know, the, I was seeing his mom, I was talking about Noreen. 
Well, this dude, he one time he came to church, and I was behind the piano, and I had a boom mic. This was many years ago. And he, uh, you know, and I was doing something. And you know what he, later on he came up to me and he said, you know, Brian, there's a different side of you that I saw come out when you're behind that piano and you got that boom mic. You know, because I just know you, you're just, you're just Brian, you know. You're just the dude that we just hang out with. But you know what? Man, I, I just see this something that comes from the inside of you when you're behind that piano and you're able to just, just, you know, I don't know. I, I'm not a great musician or anything, but the, the point is, is that those of you who know me know that music is a part of me. I just can't help it. it it's just, but you know what? That's one way that I'm loving God with soul because that's, that's who I am, okay? It doesn't mean that I'm better than you. I'm not better than you. You're not better than me. I'm not better than you. But when we are who we are, then we are loving God with soul because we are honoring God. God doesn't make mistakes. You know, when we were at Redwood Camp, one of the texts I used was Psalm 139. You should read that sometime. God was thinking about you before you were even born when you were still in your mother's womb. See, man, but you know what? We're all running away because we think, ah, oh, I got, so then you got to try to pretend to be somebody you're not. Okay, I could never come up here and in a million years be Pastor Cotts with his great Bible exegetical teaching, but I'm not supposed to be Pastor Cotts. I'm supposed to be Brian because this is who I am. And when Michael spoke, he's Michael. When Pastor Lori speaks or Pastor Tim or Pastor Stan or whoever else, they are supposed to be the best who they are. That's what God wants. And when all of us are being who we are, then the body is working the way it should be. Thank God we're not all good at everything because we'd be unsufferable. I can't stand people who are always right, right? They're just... the. Uh, yeah, it's not much fun to be around those guys. <laughs> I'd rather be with someone who's always loving than somebody who's always right. That's not in my notes. I just threw that in there. Okay. Um, you know what? So get, get this. So when you are connected to that vine, when you are in love, because you are being who you are, you are energized. I remember there a time, you know, we'd, we'd have a band rehearsal. This is the old days. Yeah, I don't play now. But back when I was doing it, we would, uh, we would have rehearsal. And sometimes, dude, I would be uh, tired because, you know, five days a week at work, and then I'm tired, and I'm just barely hanging. But then we, we'd go down to church on Friday night, and i meet with my mates, all my fellow musicians. And, you know, we got the sound guy, and, and, and then we're, we're, we're playing music. One time I was doing this with, with Michael, because later on, he started playing, and a, couple, a few times we played together, and we'd always drive together. And so the thing is, we're coming back, and he goes, hey, Dad, you want to grab a bite to eat? You know, it's like 11 o'clock. I, I got up at 5 in the morning to go to work. But I would, yeah. You know why? Because I was energized. I was in the flow. I was connected to the vine. That I was living out of soul because I was being who God shaped me to be. See, guys, soul is not something we can readily explain. We just know it. It moves us. And when we recognize it, we can see it, acknowledge it, name it, and express our gratitude for it. And when we do that, guys, we are loving God with soul. And you know what? When we are living out of place of a, out of soul, we are better. And it carries on to us. You know, if we're not, if we're living out of a bad place, guess what? That gets passed on too. Okay, you know what? Uh, there's a, a saying uh, by Richard Rohr, and he says this, if you do not transform your pain, you will surely transmit it. So when you're in a bad, and guess who, when I'm in a bad place, guess who gets it? It's Sandy, poor thing, because she has to live with me every day. 
the fact that she's still with me after all these years, it's, that's a miracle. But the thing is, but when I'm in a good place, it passes on to her as well. You know. So, and that leads me to my last story. So, a few years ago, uh, Pastor Kotz had asked me to come and speak. And uh, thank you, for Lori, for reminding me what it was, because I forgot. It was so long ago. Okay, but anyway, whatever it was, after it was over, you know how some people come up to you and they, they want to just make chit-chat and stuff? Well, this guy comes up to me, and uh, but it, it, I, I could tell that it was a little bit different. He didn't want to just simply make small talk, man. He, he wanted to really talk about, well, talk about what I talked about. <laughs> And I, and I could tell that he was really interested. But, you know, out of that uh, converse, brief conversation many, many years ago, and I know it was many years ago because I was talking to Pastor Tim last week, and he wasn't here yet at the church at that time, but has been born uh, just a real deep and soulful friendship. And what I mean by that soulful friendship, it's a friendship where... It's pretty no holes barred, you know. We just pretty much talk about everything, you know. If you if you ask this guy, no, you know. And you know, when people that know both of us, they say, "You guys talk like every week." Uh, yeah. How long have you been doing this? For years, years. How long you talk? An hour. An hour once a week. For how many years? Yeah, I know it's kind of it's kind of strange to me too when I think about this. But you know, th this this person is Paul Tamura. It's Pastor Lori's husband. And you know, the, the the fact of the matter is, guys, we are very different. But something inexplicable happens. It's kind of like when I'm on Maui. And I get that weird, just feeling of connection with my mom. See, see, this friendship that I have, it is a friendship of soul. And I think, I'm fairly confident if you were asked Paul, he would say something similar. And you know the proof of the pudding is this. You know, in anything, when you are living out of a place of, a, of soul, living out of a place where you really are, are you a little bit better? Are you a little bit more loving? Are you a little bit kinder? Are you a little bit more patient? And for me, I can say this, that because of this friendship, I'm a little bit better man. You see, guys, when we are in the river, when we are connected to the vine, we are better. We are more loving because the vine is love. And when we are in that place, when we are in a better place, a place that allows us to be a little kinder, loving, more patient, then and then we are doing our bit to bring heaven to earth. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's pray.